This is Facility Rockstars, the podcast that celebrates the unsung heroes of our daily lives, facility professionals. I'm your host, Jay Culbert. Join me as we honor these great leaders, sharing stories, insights, and expertise that empower us all to learn and grow together. Facility Rockstars is sponsored by Kalutus, operating the way you operate in order to make your life easier. Welcome to Facility Rockstars. I'm your host, Jay Culbert, and I'm thrilled to introduce today's guest. He's a technically minded and solution oriented professional with over 15 years of experience in the manufacturing industry. He has a proven track record of success in coordinating management, customers, and maintenance staff to achieve company goals. He's well versed in managing capital projects from inception to successful completion within time and budgetary constraints. He's currently the facilities manager at L3 Harris Technologies with a national scope. And I happen to know that he likes to rip up on the trails in his snow, his snow machine in the winters. So please help me welcome John Gancars. Welcome to the show. Thank you, Jay. Uh, thank you very much for inviting me here today. And, and uh, really, you know, and you like uh, being part of this uh, podcast. Well, it's my pleasure to have you here. And we're, we're grateful that you joined, John. Thanks for taking the time with us. So over the years, you've clearly you've been in, in uh, the manufacturing industry for a long time now. Uh, through aerospace and other other um, aspects of that, right? You know, my question is, what has been your biggest lesson learned as a facility leader? Well, there's you know, as a facility you know um, manager uh, working in facilities, you know, anyone who you know has a similar roles, um, you know, has been involved in projects. Um, you've been in, pro you know, you, you know, I mean, you, your work um, doing projects, you're doing projects at home, but. One of the things I found, even with you know smaller projects, is is having you know a clear you know what is referred to as a SOW or statement of work, and what that document does, it helps between the, both parties. You know, one being me, um, the customer, and the seller being you know a contractor. So with uh, so that clearly defines you know what work needs to be done. And, and typically, you know, what's very crucial is is to have you know very you know a few paragraphs that describe, you know, the overall scope of the project. And 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 the reason I, I this one sticks out for me is you know even for smaller projects, you know, that you feel like you can you know have a person come in or persons come in, you know, have a discussion. It's small enough, but yet sometimes things get forgotten. You know, from the initial discussion, project takes off. And the, all the work isn't necessarily done, um, you know, to, as planned and as discussed and agreed upon. Um, so, you know, some, you know, so a few, you know, once or twice, you know, you, you take your lessons learned here and says, okay. Um, so documentation, it, you know, for me is very, you know, formal. So anytime I engage, you know, you know, in facilities, you know, restructure a, Con, you know, construction you know, project of, you know, various types of, you know, sizes, uh, which may include, you know, you know, a few contractors. It may a few in, involve a few, uh, you know, a lot more contractors uh, from outside that, you know, all have to participate in, you know, you know, supporting the task at hand. So, as I mentioned a little bit earlier, having a clear and concise, you know, overall statement, you know, paragraphs of what the project is. Um, along with those statements, it's it's you know important you know I find to have either you know pictorials um, available or you have uh, drawing layouts you know you can show to the sellers um, you know so it helps define and make more clear um, what you know the project at hand um, you know is being described as um, and as you go on then you have you know you can define your subtasks so to speak I'm just going to you know do it in a highlight fashion here without getting into you know the you know the weeds too far but well, then your well John I, I we want all of this detail and I want to actually ask you something about oh, okay. one item sure. you just said because we had talked maybe a few weeks ago and I like how you conveyed you you said what did you just say there's a scope of work there's a pictorial there's there's plans because you have many different audiences and people see things in different ways. I don't want to put the right. way, like, I don't remember exactly how you explained it, but like, say you're walking with a contractor, they look at it one way. An right. engineer looks at it. Maybe could, could you, could you speak to that for a minute? Am I remembering where we were going with that? Um, well, as when, when, 
Well, establish. Well, first with the sow, you you you're internally um, talking. You know, with the engineers, you're internally talking with your process people um, in order f- for say myself to actually compose a statement of work before I would start soliciting it to outside contractors, I would need to better understand to make sure they understand you know, what we're asking for in terms of, you know, what, what is it, what work are we looking to have done? You know, if we're looking to expand operations, are we looking to just, you know, you know, uh, install new equipment? Oh, but by the way, we may need to do some light construction to, um, you know, expand some walls to allow, you know, the installation of this equipment. So it's very important, um, good point, uh, Jay, is to have an internal buy-off. And actually everyone has to, you know, and, and sign off too, because you, you'd you have, um, you know, uh, you know, meetings to discuss, you know, the project, what's involved, what are their needs, you know, because basically, you know, I'm, they're a customer to me and, and I'm a customer to them. So you have internal customers and external uh, customers, mm-hmm. but ideally, you're trying to, you know, define. Okay, all right. So you need to do this. All right. So you need this piece of equipment. You now, so being a facilities guy, I'm going to tell you what you you're going to need to install it, have it, you know, connected, hooked up. Uh, what utilities, uh, what mechanicals are going to be needed to you know, have done. But from an engineering point of view, um, you know, they would might want to specify certain types of um, components that may need to be used, you know, for for their needs. You know, whether you know, certain types of connectors, certain types of piping, um, it, it can go on and on. All those, all those, you know, subtasks or tangibles need to be part of the sale, ultimately going out to the seller, you know, as you solicit to the seller. So it's very crucial to one, start internally, you know, put together your details, you know, what, you know, what are, you know, the internal customers looking for. And then once everyone agrees, you know, what needs to be done, um, and, and, and the buy-off is there. And then that's when I go to work and take all this data, put it together, you know, put it in a summary, um, you know, have my summaries and subtasks, and you go through the different uh, levels in the statement of work that involve pictorials, um, drawing layouts, you know, any type of data that would help make more clear to the seller for what you're looking for, you know, initially. And again, you know they're going to get ultimately get the you know the, the document and then um you know as they you know go through my thoughts here um you're going to have you know there's always going to be questions initially um so typically what i would do um is you know if you have a large enough project um you're going to have um your all, you know all your um so, you know solicited contractors and typically i would like to have like a preliminary meeting after mm-hmm. you know it's been solicited to the folks you know they come into the um, building uh we we, uh, we could do a walkthrough and we sit at a conference table discuss my you know my my sow if you will mm-hmm. and go through it and, and actually it wor- that works so well because it brings about questions from each person and each person understands oh okay uh if we're doing this then i need to do that and 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 is you know, really good camaraderie with all the parties involved. And ideally, I'm I'm not afraid to invite people like that because everyone knows their competitors as they come in. You know, everyone knows like for this type of work, they know who else is out there. So mm-hmm. it, it makes it, you know, into more of a competitive thing. You gain relationships, but you know, more importantly, it really you know, brings to light, you know, some of those things that, you know, maybe I've forgotten and they, and they, uh, you know, reminded me, oh, if you're going to be doing this, John, uh, you need to do this and this is okay. Good point. I'll amend us out. Um, well, you know, I'd just, say I'd add to that too, John, because uh, clearly I've been in some of those meetings with you. Yes. Uh, you, you've been kind enough to have us there. And I remember a high level of not only, um, data, but collaboration. Yes. And there's, you know, and, and you, you mentioned competitors, but also, uh, complimentary uh trades if you will yes. and the way you've done a nice job in in my view of pulling them all together and really making you know, like making it very cohesive and, right and one other thing that you you mentioned um was like i i hear you say you know as a facility manager you really need to do your homework you need to do your due diligence and there's i don't know what kind of a lead time there is or how much is involved before you actually have this meeting but it sounds like there's a ton of work that you're putting into this there, there is, you know, uh, again, 
the amount of work that's you know pulled together uh, bef before a, a statement of work is solicited out, you know, there's a lot of work on, on, on my end of pulling this together, you know, ensuring that I have you know proper um, points, subtasks covered, you know, proper drawing layouts, you know, everything you know that I would want to specify for like you know electrical uh, needs, you know, um, you know the type of policies because ideally, you know, we have. Uh, established a a list of you know say uh, policies if we all, that would uh, apply to company um, you know standards like you know for electrical for mechanical um, and and uh, HVAC um, you know that as part of the SAW you know I've actually taken that statement and actually it's part of the SAW it's it's like an addendum um, at the end of it to say okay here's all the work but in this addendum it tells you like you know you know, disconnects have to be a certain distance away from from equipment. You know, sure. if you're using compressed air, you know, we'll we'll specify either you're going to use copper or you use aluminum. You know, mm -hmm. and, and and if you're using copper, you know, are they sweated joints or are they propressed joints? So I mean, it goes on to you know you know the type of specifications you know that I would want, and that's in that that type of addendum document. You know, so that to the respective uh, contractors, they're clear as to what they're going to propose and what they're, you know, going to have to buy from materials in order to, you know, provide the work for me. I, it sounds like you're eliminating uh, future surprises or, you know, right. uh, un, unforeseen challenges. You're really uncovering a lot of it right on the upfront and the clarity yes. of the scope is, is key. Because I, ideally, you know, what happens is, and I mean, if, if if ultimately you don't mind, you know, giving you know the contractors latitude, um, you know they'll bid the thing, you know, on based on cheapest product, and they'll, and, and they could charge you more. But the thing is, or um, you know, you know, for example, um, you know, when I had um, you know, a job done, um, they were you know for copper, you know, compressed air, it was a mediocre type of job, but ideally, you know. I would have preferred, uh, you know, pro press versus, you know, soldered, you know, you know, joints, you know, you know, which would look nicer and just, you know, and it's easier to um, manipulate if you need to do some mods later on. Okay. So because I wasn't specific, you know, they got away with doing it the soldered way versus pro press. And that so, was a cost driven it, it, decision on their yes, part. Right? Yes. Yeah. Yep. Makes sense. Um, I want to I, I want to shift us to communication for a sec, John, because in this process, I mean, clearly, I've been in this process with you. Our yes. team has been in the process, so I understand what that looks like. And you're a very good communicator. How do you handle communication with your internal customers? Um, and like, what, what could you share with the audience? Uh, best practices on like, there's a lot going on here. There's a lot of data. There's a lot lot to present and and retrieve. Right. So how do you handle that? Well, the way I handle it is. Um, I, I deal with, you know, all the internal customers, you know, probably, you know, one-on-one -on -one initially, you know, to kind of, you know, better describe and get, um, you know, their needs, um, you know, as, you know, as individuals, because, and the reason I do it that way is, you know, initially just, it's me, it's for an information, you know, dump, if you will, from all these individuals. And, and sometimes, you know, those, um, separate customers, if you will, internal customers, um, could respond better, you know, on a one-on-one -on -one type of, you know, conversation versus, you know, being in a room with, you know, say, you know, you know, six or more people, you know, for example, um, you know, going through that. So I'll, I'll initially, you know, do, um, you know, gain, you know, initial information. And then once I, I do that, then, you know, I want to schedule, you know, um, a meeting between, you know, engineering staff, um, if IT staff um, need to be involved, because usually if um, you're installing, you know, a renovation or, or even a new plant, you know, you're going to need Wi-Fi and things like that. So you need to, you know, include, you know, that type of staff, um, your process people. All right. So you're you're installing a new process. Um, you know, they would have to be part of this decision also mm -hmm. as coming in here at the end. And OK, so then everyone sitting at the table, we talk about the plant. OK. Um, so I'll have, obviously with my background, I, I do a lot of design work. I'll have the plan in front of everybody, you know, mm -hmm. even, even your own copy. <laughs> <laughs> um, so we'll look at the plan, you know, initially it says, okay. Um, 
you know, here's what we're looking at. And, um, you know, does, you know, everyone, you know, see, you know, and agree with, you know, what, you know, my understanding is for, for their input. And if it's, if it, if I'm off and that's where we, you know, mark up the drawings or do some changes, get it right. Um, mm -hmm. so that, okay. you know, by the time it gets outside of the building, it's, Basically, you know, 99% accurate. I mean, there's sometimes there's changes after forethought that even during several meetings you could still miss um, mm -hmm. that you capture um, once the project starts. Um, you know, that can happen. But initially, I tried to make sure that internally everyone is under the uh, understanding that, okay, here's what we agreed to. Here's what we need. Okay. And then it's my job. Um to take on that task and get the work done. Perfect. So one-on-one so -on -one meeting, several departments, um, how do you capture all the data? Where does it get, is it a central saved location? Yeah, uh, like, we, is it we email? Generally, uh, I would, you know, it depends if you, if you're working with teams or you have SharePoint. So if you have a, a mm -hmm. SharePoint site um, folder, then um, you invite, but typically I like to use teams uh, sometimes more because when, when you're on the road, you know, uh, teams, uh, for me, uh, works better, um, you know, than, sh you know, sometimes in the SharePoint and sometimes people have trouble with SharePoint, but everyone has access for teams. So you set up a teams folder, um, you invite only those members so that, you know, not anyone can get into it because it's only, um, uh, you know, for those members. And ideally, like say, if I was, um, the teams, uh, you know, leader in, in assigning, you know, uh, access for others you know other people can see stuff and be able to you know add files to it but you know it's just a common library you know for where all our initial notes are you know is you know the budget okay obviously we have to have a budget so as we go through all this um you know i'm working with others and finance to develop a budget you know for this project um you know all those files are in there um so that as you know we finally get the project kicked off and, and people have questions or, or want to add all that data is right there, you know, to be shared with, you know, that select group of people. That sounds very user-friendly and you can access it from anywhere. Obviously right. it's all cloud-based. Good. That's fantastic. I, <laughs> I don't want to mention, I, I don't know how many walkthroughs we've done, but I have <laughs> to tell you, John, I always enjoy them with you because <laughs> Yes, there's this clear scope of work. So we know what we're looking at, right? Myself and the team know. We know what you're asking of us. And it's always fun to walk through because we'll talk about a snowmobile or we'll talk about something yeah. else. And it's just, and, you know, it's, it's, yeah. I think it's important to keep it light and to yeah. be, well, it's, know, and, it's, it, it helps, it relaxes the atmosphere, you know. So, you know, it's not just, you know, you know, work, 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 work. And yeah, mm -hmm. let's, you know, let's talk about some personal life. You know, what'd you do last night? You know, you know, whatever. And, mm -hmm. and, and you build an, and like you, Jay, you know, I, I love to build relationships with common contractors, you know, contractors who, who know me, who know the company, know how to respond to the company, know what's expected of the company. So that way there, everyone's on the same page, we're, you know, we're like friends working through mm -hmm. the tasks. And, and generally, I mean, and you know, I mean, you know, sometimes, you know, you get into a project and, and you uncover, you know, the old, you know, can of worms, you know, and this mm -hmm. old project house and stuff like that. And, and, and none of us expected this and just like, and, and we collaborate, you know, what's, you know, what's the best way to mitigate this, you know, with the least impact on cost and time. And, and we, and we go from there and those are the relationships I know, like for you guys and, and others would, you know, really, you know, do us a, a real honest, you know, favor to get the work done. And, and again, you know, it's just, it just works out well for everybody. And and that's, I like to build relationships with common people. I don't necessarily like to solicit unless I absolutely have to, but you know, sometimes I have to based on the size of the project and, and what the you know budget dollar is. Sure. Well, it, that, of course that's understandable. And I think, um, for us, we're not a transactional company. You know that right. we would rather like we're, we're talking today and you don't work where you worked when we met. Um, right. You know, but that relationship's there. And it, for me, it's all about trust, John. And I think you and I have talked about that several times, yes. you know, having, having a mutual trust and, um, yes. and you know what to expect and we know expect yeah. what to expect. And I know, I know what to expect from you guys. And I'm sure, you know, like, again, likewise. And, and again, that's the right. trust I, I like to build with, you know, you know, uh, you know, you guys. Um, you know, electricians, you know, you know, um, 
HVAC guys. You know, it goes it goes on and on. And but for my current position now, where I do, um, you know, I work remote. Um, I travel around a, a lot because you know lately I've been uh, on the road a lot. So I've been uh, traveling to not far down the street here, um, but Northampton, Mass. Um, I go down to Maryland. I go down to Philly. Recently, I've been going over to Saint, uh, Anaheim, California. Um, so I've been on the road uh, so far uh, 19 straight weeks. So, I mean, oh, that's boy. Uh, and, and, uh, and uh, going around, you know, um, managing and, and supporting facilities needs. So, yeah. And, and you know, even as I, I'm home today, this is this is the right. first time I've been home in that time. <laughs> yeah, be, besides the weekend. <laughs> you have a few days, I hope. Or yeah, you're yeah. right back on the road. No, I, I go back to Anaheim Monday. So uh, at least I have uh, I have today and tomorrow uh, to kind of catch my breath a little bit. <laughs> so, good for you. <laughs> in home. So it, it's it's good. I, I mean, I love to travel and I and, and I love meeting the people at all the different locations because ideally um, I wasn't planning to go back out to Anaheim, um, you know, so quick. But uh, yesterday um, I had to make, you know, they wanted me back out there. I says, OK, I'm, I'm on the phone with our traveling agency and booking plans. <laughs> so. Oh, it's yeah. dynamic. Well, I was just going to ask you too. What's your favorite part of the job? It, is the travel exciting? It's going to be tasking, but what's your favorite um, part it, of the job? The well, the favorite part of the job is is doing the work and meeting the people. I mean, you know, at first, you know, the the flying and and all that, you know, seemed you know nice, but you know that's that's kind of growing old, and 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 sure. that can change. I mean, you can have some good flights and you have some really ugly flights, you know, that, you know, with the delays, the layovers and, you know, you, you know, you've traveled. I mean, a lot of people mm -hmm. have traveled and, and go through that. So, um, but you know, the traveling down to, you know, for example, down to Northampton, that's just the drive. I mean, that's, it's three hours, but it's, it's a drive down there. I stay down there. And then, you know, at the end of the week, I come back home, you know, so I can do my home projects mm -hmm. <laughs> so, and then go back out <laughs> the following Monday. So. <laughs> the never ending list of projects yeah. wherever yeah. you are. Yeah. Um, John, I don't want to skip over the compliance discussion that that we've had right. throughout the years, too. And I think I think, you know, the audience and other FMs out there would would definitely benefit from what you could share around that, like. With with regard to regulations, inspections, audits, you know, right. overall compliance. I mean, what, ideally, what, you, what do you face? Yeah, I, ideally, you know, I you know, I deal with, um, you know, local agencies. Um, and, you know, as you do any type of work, um, you know, states, you know, every state is a little bit different. You know, in terms of you know what you need the permit for. Mm -hmm. um, now, actually, Northampton is a very stringent one for permits. So you know, for water runoff. You know, for, you know, pretty much anything I do down there uh, may require a, a permit. But in, in dealing with local uh, agencies like that, um, you know, they're, you know, they're, they, you know, you, they're trying to, you know, ensure uh, that I'm complying to their, you know, regulations and specifications, you know, for certain things. So in dealing with those folks, I deal with a lot of them, um, you know, every, almost every week, you know, for certain things as I'm doing you know, small uh, construction jobs right now, but a lot of it's just, you know, maintaining PMs for right now until they find a full-time position. So that's why I'm helping out with that down there. But for other jobs, you know, you have, um, you know, for example, a big one is um, is FM Global. Okay, as you know, some, if, if you know, FM Global is basically, mm -hmm. it's an insurer, um, you know, property insurer, you know, that uh, insurance for property loss and, and, and they offer also protection uh, services and engineering services. Uh, they're, they're big on, you know, uh, safety uh, systems such as, you know, you know, fire sprinkler, you know, fire control systems where, you know, if you are insured by them, um, they're, you know, depending on the size of you, I mean, they could, you know, they could, you know, be able to capacity up to two billion dollars. You know, I was I was doing a little bit of research, you know, earlier on, and um, but at any rate, um, if you are insured under them, you do have to comply uh, with you know their specifications for sprinkler, uh, for example. Um, you know, you have the right type of sprinkler um, piping and heads for your your shipping area. You know, if you have pallet racks, for example. You need certain uh, coverage of sprinkler heads. They're basically high flow heads because when you stack things on on um, pallet racks, 
with plastics and woods. You know, they burn rather hot. hot. They, they are harder to put out. So you need to really ensure that you can douse them, you know, with the proper amount of water to put, you know, put them out. Um, you know, they look at the pumps to make sure that the pumps that you have supply enough water, um, you know, for the given size of property, you know, of a production space. Um, that's Ooh. all the things I've, I've dealt with and had them come on site, you know, for um, annual inspections, you know, for stuff like that. So hi. How do you prepare for that, John? Like, it, so if it's an annual inspection, is this a? What's your best practice around? All, are you always ready? Is there a weekly, monthly, quarterly? Well, internally, it, well, internally, we conduct. You know, I mean, uh, you would conduct uh, as part of your preventive maintenance plan, and this is, and this would be like one of them, and this is like a systems check. You, you know, as part of a PM plan. Um, you would uh, have, you know, one of your facility staff um, go around, you know, validate, you know, make sure you go into like, say, you know, your, your pump rooms, you know, where all your, your, your sprinkler rises are, you know, are they in good shape? I mean, is there leaks? Um, is, is there, you know, uh, let, you know, is there a blinking red light? Is, you know, something not right on the panel? Okay. You, you, you note it down um, and then you, you give me a call and, and I would take it from there to get, you know, the right, people, it would be a sprinkler company to come in and, and correct those things. But, you know, given that fact where you'd be proactive and just make sure the systems are in good working order, they're clean looking, um, and just, you know, in nice condition, just makes you all that much better so that when you come in for an annual with an FM global agent, um, you know, they look at it, um, they may find something, um, you know, for a, a, a noted repair. You know, sometimes they're small. Um, you know, it's just it's just a note to say, okay, well, it's on watch. Uh, we'll 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 look at it, ne you know, next time, you know, in our next uh, review. But you know, if it is something of you know, major, uh, you know, value to be repaired, then they would note that, and then we would have to repair it. But it. but FM Global is also in, you know involved with where you know if you impair your um, security systems, you know, for, you know, sprinkler, fire sprinkler. So you first have to contact them to let them know that you're taking down the system, you know, for either repairs or for modifications, you know, whatever that is, you know, so that they know it's in their system and they, you know, in case something goes wrong, you know, they were notified um, that you had an Understood. impairment. Um, you know, there's also hot work permits, you know, of that nature. So you have to do hot work permits for if you're welding, uh, grinding anything that can generate an arc or or sparks, um, you know, you have to you know do you know that's an internal thing. That's not necessarily something for them, but it's for you. That's something you have to document um, for you know do you know conducting that style or type of work. Um, okay, it's another requirement of them, so that you know they will look at those too to see like you know, how much you know welding, how much grinding have you done, and you can show them you know all the tags and everything you know as as uh, you you do that. I'm hearing a lot around fire suppression, spark, um, hot work. Are there any other, or maybe that's the, clearly the predominant thing that needs to be watched. Is, right. Are there other safety parameters or does OSHA come in at all or any other regulatory? Well, that's, that's a different agency uh, in terms of, you know, FM global piece. Yes. For, you know, for uh, life safety in that regards, that's FM global. But in terms of OSHA, I mean, I, I have dealt with those with, when there was a case, um, you know, if, if there's a, a, you know, a recording or an issue where, you know, if someone got hurt, um, you, you'd have to go through a process to identify like, you know, what was the, you know, what happened, what was the cause and what transpired, you know, for that individual to get hurt. But generally speaking, um, you know, OSHA does, um, you know, have, you know, regulations and rules that, you know, any, company, you know, should, you know, needs to comply to, you know, whether, you know, if you're doing, you know, working with chemicals, you know, the proper PPE that you need for that, whether they're using material handling equipment, um, i.e. a scissor lift, a boom lift, um, you know, there's certain uh, regulations, you know, for the individuals using that, you know, whether you need certain PPEs, a hard hat, do you need a, um, a, a lanyard, you know, tied to a body harness in, in the case of a, a boom lift? Um, and, and so on, and, and, and they need to be certified. So ideally not just anyone can, you know, get onto material handling devices. They have to be certified, um, to that. And I would highly recommend, um, to any of the staff in, in which that I've been involved with, you know, now and in, in, in the past 
is a minimum of a 10 year, uh, I'm 10 year, I'm sorry. Um, uh, 10 hour OSHA, a 10 hour OSHA and a 30 sure. hour OSHA. Mm -hmm. Ideally I'd push the 30 hour OSHA, you know, much greater, um, mm -hmm. than the 10, you know, so that, you know, the individuals would have a better understanding, you know, more global understanding for what's going on in terms of working in the plant, you know, how to be safe. You know, if you see unsafe, unsafe acts by others, you know, they can act on it and, and, and train those individuals and just internally, it just, it just domino effects, you know, safety, you know, throughout of the facility. More of a culture at that point, yes. really. Yeah, exactly. Good. This is, this is great data. This is great knowledge. Thank you for sharing it, John. Um, you, you, you said something before we started the show, you showed me something. <laughs> Someone gave you something that I think yes. the audience would relate to I, a, a mug. Um, yeah. So, so leading on to that, so in working down um, at the uh, Northampton facility and, and, and the person that left there, his name was John. And I happened to see this, this picture of a mug and, and I, 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 I loved exactly what it said because it's so true to any facilities person. So if I may, I'll show this so that, you know, the audience can see this. And if, um, if you can so relate to that. Man I'll, I'll read it since I'm okay. looking right at it, John. So facilities manager, we do precision guesswork based on unreliable data provided by those of questionable knowledge. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, yeah, I mean, a lot of times, you know, you know, the internal customers, they, they may not know exactly, you know, what they want or how to go about it. And that's where, you know, we as facilities people, you know, have to come in and, um, you know, support them in, in the best way that we can, you know, whether if we can do it or we need outside help, um, you know, to support those, you know, type of functions. But that to me pretty much says it in a nutshell. <laughs> Priceless. <laughs> I, I think it goes right back to your due diligence and homework, right? Because if that's the case sometimes, well, how do you mitigate that? How do you minimize that and, and right. still be successful? And, and, and everything and, you walked and, us and all that is is just working with the teams because I find that you know in in discussions like this and sometimes you know the group discussions work better where people all have their own points of view their own visions of how the project should go and it and the other people as one person's talking can start to develop oh I didn't think of that of it that way and and, and it it becomes such a dialogue you know you've seen the big group meetings and it just of we're there for hours. And, mm -hmm. but to me, a lot of people say, well, yeah, you're there for hours, but it's very productive. And, and people walked away with an understanding with like mental schedules, who's doing what, when the timing, all that is there. And, and that's right. where, you know, again, I put, pull to, I would pull together a schedule, um, you know, to that reflected, you know, that meeting. So everyone's on the same page, that schedule would flow out with the, the statement of work. You know, that's one of the subtasks, you know, that would be in a, in a, in a statement of work, um, you know, as a, you know, going forward. And then um, to actually go back to the sow and, and looking at, you know, some of the deliverables from the seller is, you know, they have, I have my schedule, but they get to put together their schedule um, for when they, you know, start in completion based on the data that was generated um, provide any design drawings back to me, you know, electricals, mechanicals, HVAC, you know, et cetera. So if there's structural civil drawings for, for physical construction of building inside or if it's outside of the building um, and it goes on. So, you know, some of the, you know, that have the deliverables have to be clearly noted um, in, in uh, the statement of work also, along with payment terms. And, and that's always sometimes, you know, a thorn to, for some people, um, you know, certain, Certain uh, contractors, um, you know, may not, you know, like the, you know, the payment terms, you know, that as a company's, you know, say for our, you know, our company is, is normally like net 60, you know, sometimes you can have companies with net 45, net, you know, 90 days. And, and, and a lot of the smaller contractors can't live with something like, you know, that, that type of duration. So, you know, that's where, you know, not me, but it's finance and negotiate, you know, with those, you know, those contractors, if you will. You know, if we can allow them to go net 30s and things like that. So that has to be covered, you know, in, in the statement of work, too, as as a financial clause that's in there for, you know, so that the contractors who are doing the bidding, they understand what the uh, net terms are. 
I think that's a good point you bring up. It's a very good point because, and I'd, I'd actually like to give a shout out to uh, the companies that you've worked with where we've worked with you because we've entered discussions with procurement before. And I have right. to say they were very open and they were very flexible if and when needed. Right. And we, like that, it's, you know, it's, that's a partnership. Like there's right. a little bit, it's equitable for both parties and right. we, we came to an agreement with each other. And, so, and, and again, so you know, we're, you know, I love to use you guys all the time. And, and if that's something that we need to negotiate, we can come to, you know, really good terms between each other. That's, you know, amicable between both parties mm -hmm. and we carry on. I mean, mm -hmm. uh, uh, I, I can't say it any other, you know, better way. So, I mean, it's just, you know, again, you know, projects, you know, no matter what size, um, you really need to be clear, um, you know, in, in some kind of form of writing and description and task and deliverables, what you're asking for, because things can get lost. I mean, as the project carries on, you know, the project can take a month or a project can take a year and a half, you know, things can get forgotten and lost. So if things get, you go back to your documents to say, okay, this is what we're supposed to be doing and, and, and to ensure that's going to, you know, be complied to. Right. Of course, I, I'm reading a note that I took, um, in one of our previous discussions, John, and I think you touched on this, but I want to read it back anyway, because I think okay. it applies to all of this. Um, you would, I, and correct me if I'm wrong, but I believe your words were do these things properly and consistently, and that will build trust. Right. Right. I think the, the do, doing things properly, of course, and then being consistent in that behavior right. is, uh, what I heard from you anyway. Yes. Consistency is, is, is a high thing, you know, for me, uh, that, you know, as I deal with, you know, all the different sites I travel to and, and how I, you know, pr you know, how I proceed with the, you know, folks there, how I introduce myself and, and what, you know, the expectations are, you know, it's, you know, I make it, you know, very clear so that, you know, and they just understand, you know, mm -hmm. I'm, I'm talking with other facilities, people over there, they, they understand. So you build this relationship and, and you're consistent. And, and that's ultimately what our company's trying to do globally is, is to try to be, you know, define consistent systems for all the, all the plants. So that one plant isn't, you know, conducting business this way, another one's doing it that way. So how we manage facilities, how we manage, you know, finance, we're, we're trying to all be consistent the same way so that when, you know, I, you know, you travel around to all the different segments, all the different divisions, you know, for our company, Everyone's doing it the same way, you know, for the type of work. Everyone's doing different work, but you're being consistent in how you're managing it and going about it. I'd say that's key with any business and or any any successful venture. If you're yes. consistent, you're you're much more likely to be successful, right? And, right. And have the outcome, the desired outcome. Right. Um, so I want to be mindful of your time, John, and I want to like we've learned a ton from you in the last, I'll say, forty minutes here. I think the audience might want to know a little bit more about John. Like, who are who's John? Right? What's your story? Um, if I were to ask you, well, let's have some fun with it, right? Yeah. So, exactly. if 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 today's John Gancars had advice for the twenty year old John, what might that be? I mean. That's, that's, uh, that's a good one. That's a good one, Jay. So if we, I mean, obviously as we're growing, you know, you know, getting, you know, up through life, um, uh, you're learning, um, stuff. Um, you, you try to, I, I would, you know, try to work with, you know, um, higher up, you know, whether it be facilities and, and, and other types of, you know, uh, business departments, if you will, um, to learn and pick more from their minds because, if you don't, you know, I, I got to say this, you know, I guess my, what my dad would say, would say to me, he says, is he told me you know, when I was you know really young, he says, I can tell you, you know, wrong from right. All right. I know you're not going to listen to me. You're going to figure it out on your own, but experience is your best teacher ultimately. And, and he's so right. I mean, you, you learn from your mistakes, you know, um, you know, how you conduct business, how you do things, you know, you know, working with people. Um, so, I, I think it's very important that, you know, in talking with, you know, seasoned, you know, experienced people that you can learn a lot from their experiences and, and kind of use it as a stepping stone to develop yours as you're, as you're growing your tenure. So true. 
That's fantastic. And thank you for sharing that about your father. And it's, I love what he said. I can teach you right from wrong, but you know, you learn from your mistakes and experience, right? Yeah, experience is your teacher. Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's awesome. So you're a New Hampshire guy. Yes, I um, am. Have you always been a New Hampshire uh, yes, resident? Yes, I have. I've, or... I've been born and raised in New Hampshire. Um, I never moved out of the state um, to live. I moved to other towns within the state to live. Um, you know, uh, my younger, I was, you know, basically I was raised on a farm. Um, I, I learned the hard knocks really quick. Um, you know, I was training, you know, with my grandfather and my dad, you know, it was good. We had a farm, you know, operating equipment. So, you know, 12 years old, I'm on a farm wall C with a, with a sidebar cutter, cutting grass out in a hundred <laughs> acre field, you know, you know, running that. So, I mean, and I learned um, a lot by, you know, working on things. You know, I was always, you know, working my hands, always into things to take things apart, put them back together, you know, differently or, you know, better. Um, I mean, back in the day, you know, uh, I, I still talk to my brother about this, you know, growing up, so like, you know, we built go-karts out of angle iron from bed frames. Oh, you know, I love small that. Small engines. From I love it. Small engines from, uh, you know, whatever, you know, machinery that broke down, but the engines were still good. You put them on, you know, there and we, we fabricated our own fun ATVs, if you will, <laughs> and then graduated into dirt bikes and, and so on and so forth. But that's, that's what I think growing up, it, it, it taught you to think it, it taught you, you know, what, you know, cause and effect, if you will, of, of doing things. And, and, and doing that, I think at such an early age, I think it's helped me tremendously today. Oh, I bet it has. I bet that's why your scope of work is always so ironclad and clear. <laughs> if you were building, oh, I love that go-karts from bed frames. Yeah. That's fantastic. That's so did you master the braking system or was, was it all throttle? <laughs> a little bit of both. Um, yeah. you know, the, the braking, you know, axles we would get from various things that would have like, you know, you know, brakes on them, you know, to a point, but. A lot of it, you know, it was open, so you didn't really break all that much anyway. <laughs> you just kind of coasted to slow down, but, you know, there was some breaks. But I got to say, the best go-kart that I had had twin McCulloch 850s on it, and I'd probably do like a 10, 15-foot burnout with that thing. <laughs> oh. <laughs> what kind of speeds are we talking about here, uh, safely? Well, there was no odometer, but you were going. <laughs> yeah, I <laughs> you bet were you were. Going. Yeah. You know, up and down the streets or, you know, the, you know, the trails that led out to the fields and out to the woods. And, oh well, yeah, it, it was, it was a blast. I mean, you, you created your own fun and you had friends that would come in and everyone would be sharing the party and just, you know, having a good old time. You know, it was, it was good. That is just awesome. Earlier I mentioned snowmobiles and I know you and I have talked about that several yeah. times. Now I think I understand where it all spawned from the throttle, yeah. the love of the throttle. Yes. It's, it's been between the go-karts. You know, then I morphed into, you know, dirt bikes. Um, then it was street bikes, you know, and then there was always snowmobiles too, is going in parallel with the, you know, earlier stuff. You know, my dad bought, you know, the first machine that he bought was a ski rule, um, you know, back in the like late latter seventies. And, um, it, it was a good machine, but except, you know, in, in today's standards of design, you know, the fuel tank was up at the nose. So it was always nose heavy. So if you went out in mm. soft snow, you were a lawn jart. Basically, no. you go up there, you just, just kind of nosedive into it. You did say jart, didn't you? Yeah. That's a throwback right there. Yeah. Oh, I love it. So, oh, you know, stuff. so snowmobiling, you know, today, I mean, although I'm sure as many, you know, can probably, you know, contest is, you know, the winter, you know, Mother Nature hasn't been very good for this winter. And actually, the only snowmobiling I was able to do, you know, this season was around my house. So at least to, you know, just try it out, you know, rip around the house I have here. So I get a you know a good amount of acres here so I can get some speeds going, but it's too short for me. And, and then, you know, snow comes, it, it goes, but, um, you know, maybe a month ago I could have, you know, had some trips going up North, but I've been so busy with house projects. Um, this is just one of those years where I'm just going to have to bite the bullet, uh, and just wait and hope that next year is going to be better where you know, I will take some more time to, you know, if I have to travel North to go see the white, enjoy the white, then so be it. <laughs> That's great. Yeah, it's been, you're right. I, a lot of my friends uh, echoed the same and it's been a really 
light snowfall two years yeah. in a row. So the skiers, the oh, snowboarders, the, if, if you're out Midwest, it would have been you know great. Like even recently, you know, Colorado and, and those regions, you know, they're getting dumped with seven feet. It's just like you know, give me a, a half that, I'd be happy. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> even a third, something, yeah. please. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> You know, so well, the trails up north are dying out. So I mean, I'm I'm on Facebook, you know, with some of the trail clubs up there, and then some of my friends who are up been up there doing it. Even northern Maine, um, it's getting you know very you know snert, which is you know snow and dirt mix. You know, so the mm -hmm. term snert. Um, so I'm seeing mm -hmm. some pictures. I mean, the trails are good, but it's just it's not. I, I just can't do that to my machine <laughs> to run, yeah. run it in dirt like that. It thanks <laughs> you for that. I'm quite sure. Yeah. <laughs> Well, John, there's a thank you so much for not only sharing about, you know, professional uh your your growth and what you do and and all of the personal things. And I, I imagine the audience would want to know how they could get in touch with you um if they wanted to and pick your brain if you're open for that on on sure. any topics that we might sure. have covered today. What's the best sure. way for people to to reach you? They, they can reach me uh, through my um through my email. Um I'll give you um actually um my uh home email um because i'll i'll uh, you know that way there i could you know uh, you know probably respond a little bit quicker um to sure. you so um you know i don't how do you want me to provide yeah, it we'll, we'll put it in the podcast notes okay. and everyone can uh, can grab it there and then you're on linkedin too i believe yes yes right. i am so linkedin's Perfect. another uh vehicle uh you know for contact um i do looked at my linkedin um uh, there are accounts i have a couple but um you know, it doesn't matter if you, if you search my name, it'll, you know, it'll bring you to a LinkedIn that I can have access to. It don't matter. Um, and then, yeah, I'll be more than happy to talk to anyone or, or share, you know, some experience or thoughts, or, you know, if you have some question to go about something, you know, have at it. I'm open. Fantastic. John, thank you again. Thank you very much for spending the time. And it's been, and uh, I appreciate knowing you for all these years too. Just as a person, oh, so likewise, Jay. It's, it's, it's you know pleasure working with you too. I mean, you, you've been an awesome guy, in person and friend. Um, I can't say enough about you, and and, and you've always supported me for you know for everything. And I, I like to do more things on the side too. You know, I think once both of us be able to find you know five minutes to do that, <laughs> I would love that. I would love that's very kind of you, John. Thank you. I, I'd love that. Yes. All right. And if the audience uh, had a little fun today or learned something from John, feel free to. Uh, share the podcast uh, with your network. And uh, John, we will talk soon. Very good. Thank you, Jay. Thanks for having me again. Nice talking. Absolutely, my friend. Take care. Take care. It's a wrap. It's a wrap. Another episode of Facility Rockstars is in the books. Facility Rockstars is sponsored by Kalutas, operating the way you operate in order to make your life easier. Until next time, facilitate and rock on. Rock on. Rock on.